This is Dr. R. Winston Mazakis. I welcome you to our page and I hope and pray that this study will be a blessing to your life. After you have listened to this message and if you'd like to listen now or later to more studies, go to YouTube at any time. Put my name, Winston Mazakis, W-I-N-S-T-O-N, Mazakis, M-A-Z-A-K-I-S, on the YouTube search line and click on find. Once you are on our page, you can choose the study you would like to hear in English, Arabic or French. And if you are interested in studying the Bible by correspondence, free of charge, please contact the website that you see on this screen. And if you would like to study the Bible scholarly to earn a graduate of theology degree or a doctor of theology degree, please go to memjohn, that's one word, memjohn.com in order to know about the Institute of Biblical and International Studies where you will master the greatest subjects at a fraction of the cost and a fraction of the time. And I assure you, you will never regret taking this course. I know it will be a great blessing to you and probably a way for the minister. If the Lord is calling you, you'll never find anything greater than this. So this sermon is going to be two parts. The first part is the introduction and the second part to answer the question. The question is, if we were born into the family of God, why does God adopt us? I mean, we have children that were born into our household. We don't adopt them. I don't adopt my children. They are my children because they are born to me. And they are legally my legal heirs. And I don't need to adopt them to become my legal heirs. They are naturally my legal heirs. We are born into the family of God. And in the epistle to the Romans, chapter 8, verse 16, it says, The Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Why do we need adoption? Why does God adopt you? And when will God adopt us? These are two very important questions, very important questions, and we have to have the answer for them right from the Bible. And I don't think a lot of people even knew how to deal with this, but I'm going to show you how I dealt with it. Let's open our Bibles to read from Romans chapter 8, beginning with verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby ye cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit itself, beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs, co-heirs with Christ. If so, be that we suffer with him that we may be also glorified together. Now also we are going in this particular study to explore and explain the idea the magnificent idea of becoming co-heirs or joint heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. How in the world are we going to be joint heirs? What does that really, really mean? This is something that is mind-boggling and it's so ecstatically and it's so beautifully put and it's all ours. It's a tremendous, tremendous promise that even eternity will not be long enough for us to thank God for what he's done for us. What I'm going to explain here, I don't believe there can be another explanation different than what I'm given. And probably this is the first time you're going to hear this explanation because I've read so many things about adoption, but I thought people misunderstood it. And frankly, by reading their statements and listening to their thoughts, I thought they were lost in deep woods way far from everything that the Bible meant. And I feel doing this statement that God really directed my thoughts at this time. I think the Lord helped me in the first place. And of course, he used also my understanding of law as a law student to understand the subject very well. And I would like you to be the judge of that. Thank you. Frankly, as a lawyer, I know there is no other explanation for it. We're going to study this. We have to take to build the foundation for it. First of all, we mentioned that we are born into the family of God. We are not just brought into the household of God just as is without being born in it. And there are so many verses that the Bible tells us that the Christians are born into the family of God. Well, let's look at some of the verses. 
If you go to John chapter 3 and verse 3, now we're going to look at some of these verses. It would be a good idea if you can write them down and study them later because I want you to be like the people of Beriah. The people of Beriah, when they heard Paul the Apostle preaching, because he was a great preacher, they didn't accept everything he said. At face value. The Bible said they went home and studied what they heard, comparing it to the scriptures. God called them honorable people. So that's what we want to be. Here the Bible tells us in John chapter 3 and verse 3, it says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Therefore a person has to be born into the family of God. Then you have verse 5 and verse to verse 7. Marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. The one is born of the flesh is going to go into corruption. But if you are not born in the spirit, you'll never make it. Your body is going to corrupt, you're going to go to hell. But when you are born in the spirit, marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. He repeated that again in verse 7. Why? Because that's the only way to heaven, is to be born and become a child of God. And he tells us that, well, since we are in John, let's open to John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, he came to his own, his own received him not. To them gave he power, authority, to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. But how do they do that? Which were born. They were born into the family of God. When you accept Christ, you are born, literally born into the family of God. Not of blood, nor of the will of man, of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So here the Bible is telling us very clearly that we are born into the family of God. And there are many other verses, really. If you would open to Romans chapter 8, same chapter we were reading from, and verse 17. And if the children then, heirs of God, now frankly, when I die, and if the Lord tarries, I will, definitely, not some anybody else can come and take my stuff when I leave. Only my children can. So here the Bible is telling us that we are heirs of God. And the only way we can become heirs of God is become his children. But the difference between me and my children and God and his children, for my children to inherit me, what must happen first? I have to die. But for us to inherit God, what should happen first? We should die to inherit God. That's the difference. The, no, no, no. To die, to die, uh, you know, re real death, so we can go to heaven, so we can inherit eternity, you know? But that's the only way we can inherit God. Not God to die, but we die in the flesh, so we can go to heaven. And that is so important. And that's a big difference, of course. Again, First Peter chapter 1, verse 23. That is an excellent verse there. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 23. It says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. That's Jesus Christ, by the way. So we are born. We are not adopted into the family of God. We are born into the family of God. Listen, being adopted, with all my respect to everybody that is adopted, so many times I spoke with adopted people and somehow they feel, feel not very much accepted and parents are so careful how to deal with their adopted children so their children would not feel that they're rejected or there is some kind of discrimination. So in other words, and a lot of times, the relationship between the adopted, not always, between adopted parents and the adopted child, very, very sensitive and very serious. God is not going to do that. Adopt us so he can treat us like he's scared. He would feel that we're not his children. And that he's dealing with us differently. No. We are his children because we were born into his family. It's not a, a matter of adoption here. It's not a matter of sensitivity and relationship. There was no hesitation in saying that if my children are acting up, they're going to get it. Spank him. That's why the Bible says, he whom the Lord loveth, he was chastened, chastises, spanks. And that's why so many adopting parents, they 
don't dare to spank their adopted children because they're scared. If they spank them, they're going to feel that the kids will feel that their parents don't love them and then they will start not loving their parents. So that is not a good base for neither rearing up children nor dealing with children. That's why God is not going to go through this. He made us be born into the family of God. And that is a tremendous, tremendous difference and changes the whole mood of relationship. Frankly, I never hesitated spanking my sons. Never. Because they're my sons. And I don't spank them because I hated them. I spank them because I love them so much. And that's where God said again. He said, if he spanked you and he chased you because you're sons. If he doesn't, you're not sons, you're what? Bastards. That's right. Well, sure, if a guy has a bastard in his house, he doesn't care how he, he's reared. He doesn't care if he becomes a criminal or if he's well-educated. He doesn't care for that. But my son is different. He's part of my blood and my bones. And I need to make sure that he gets the best reading I can give him. Then we have one more reference, which is 1 John chapter 5 and verse 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. What this means is that if someone loves Jesus who begat us, gave us birth into the family of God, then they would love the ones that were born of him. He would love us. Amen. So here we're telling us that he begat us into the family of God. That means he gave us real birth into the family of God. In other words, we were part of his flesh and blood of the spirit. The spiritual flesh and blood. We were, look at your son, he said, he's my flesh and blood. And that's exactly what Jesus looked at us as his flesh and blood in the spiritual. Now here it's so important to know that we were born into the family of God. If we were born into the family of God, why do we have to be adopted? That's a question. That's a very important question. And it's a legal question, by the way, which the Bible also answered it so clearly. But I don't understand why so many theologians studying the Bible never even looked at that. Now, the question here, if we are the children, who is Jesus? You know, a lot of people think Jesus is our brother, only our brother. Please, allow me to give you thoughts that you've never heard before, I think. But listen to the whole thing and then give the condemnation, whether you agree or you disagree. Because this is what the Bible says, and I'm not scared at all to tell you what the Bible says. And that's so important to me, and I hope it will become important to you. Just give me a chance to give you the whole picture, and then give your judgment, okay? Hopefully, and God bless you. Because these thoughts are not mine. They are from the scripture, and you find out. And if they're not from the scriptures, and you can prove it to me, then I'll be more than glad to change. But I think this is so important to you too, to know who you are and what about your relationship with the Lord and on which basis this relation is built. But now, is Jesus our father or our brother? We'll find out from the scripture, okay? As a matter of fact, he will become our brother. But when? We'll find out in this study. But stay with me till the end of this study. It's not that long. It's just about half an hour. No, sir. Jesus is not our brother to start with. We'll come to this question of our brother of Jesus later. Yes. He will become our brother, but he's not our brother at this time. Let me explain. But Jesus is our father. And let me show you, if something I cannot prove from the scripture, I simply don't preach it. I avoid it. But if I can preach it from the scripture and show you many references, then I preach it because I'm comfortable. I'm not doing something I cannot prove. Let's look at what the Bible says here. If you open to Romans chapter 15 and verse 6, that he may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now here, the Bible is very clearly referring to God the Father as the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because so many people believe God the Father is our Father. That's what they say when we pray our Father which art in heaven, we're praying to God the Father. Now, if you notice... The Bible never referred to God the Father as our Father. Every time the Bible referred to God the Father, referred to him as God 
the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's not our father yet. And I will show you from the scripture when he will become our father. But now, whether in the Old Testament or the New Testament, you never see God the Father dealing with people. He only dealt and deals with his own son. And his own son is responsible to him for what he's doing. The only thing you hear, for example, in the Old Testament about the Father, when the scripture says, My Lord said unto my Lord. In other words, when God the Father wanted to do something in the world, he had to go through his Son. Because our God is a God of order. The three persons of the Trinity did not deal each one on his own with the world. Only through God the Son. God the Father had never dealt with people. He never tried to intervene with the creation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, he was on the council of the creation, but the actual creation was done by the second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and life was the light of men. The Bible continues to say, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they are thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him. And notice how the verse ends. And for him, that's the second person of the Trinity, which really means that he owned everything and everything belongs to him and he only deals with what he owns nobody else and since god is a god of order therefore and if they want anything they have to go through the second person of the trinity that's exactly what it means and of course the bible is 100 percent behind that idea and the bible continues and he is before all things and by him all things consist he is the second person of the trinity colossians chapter 1 verses 15 to 17 for that reason paul the apostle could say for in him we live and move and have our being acts chapter 17 verse 28 so we find out that Jesus was the one that was given all the authority and all the responsibility to deal with people. That's why he was called the Word, the very expression of the triune God. And since the triune God is a God of order, God the Father has always spoken with his Son, and he went through his Son to speak to the world. John chapter 7 verse 16 you can see that throughout the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we have God the Son, of course, so that we can become Christian. God the Holy Spirit had to have a part in the church. First, working with people to know the Lord Jesus Christ, then dwelling in people to make them the children of God. But God the Father has not yet dealt with people at any time, anywhere in all of history. But He will. Wait a minute, just wait a minute. Give me a chance to give the whole picture. However, God the Father made two entrances into the world to introduce his son when Jesus was on the face of this earth. The first time when Jesus was baptized and a voice came from heaven, God the Father was speaking there. And he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And the second appearance of God the Father was when Jesus was at the Mount of Transfiguration with his disciples and Moses and Elijah. And a voice came down from heaven. God the Father was telling something to the disciples that they should understand. And he said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. And that's it. These were the only two occasions when God the Father came out. Not dealing really with people, just assuring them that this is the God who came down to earth to save them. Our Father is Jesus. And I'm going to show you that in several places. Well, let's look at 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Okay. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy our brother, unto the church of God, which is of Corinth, who with all the saints which are in all Achaia, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here when it says, I'm sending you a greeting. Says, my son is sending you a greeting. It said, I'm sending you a greeting from my father and the pastor of the church. That doesn't mean two persons. He's talking about his father, who is his father and the pastor of the church. 
And that's the way a Middle Easterner always expresses himself, and it's understood immediately by a Middle Easterner. But in the English language, it looks like he's talking about two persons. He's talking about God and the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not doing that. He's talking, grace be unto you from God our Father, God our Father. Father, That Father who is our God is the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us on the cross. This is the church of Jesus Christ who bought it with his own blood. And God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, of course, work with God the Son, who bought this church with his own blood. When he bought it with his own blood and he paid for it with a very high price, it's his. The church is the church of Jesus Christ. And when he paid unimaginable price, and the Bible tells us how, in Philippians chapter 2, beginning with verse 6, he says about Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross in other words he bought the church with the ultimate price of shedding every drop of his precious blood to wash away every evil smelly sin that we have committed. Even God the Father turned his face away from him to the extent that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, felt so alone on the cross that he shouted to God the Father, 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 why hast thou forsaken me? And God the Father turned his face away for a reason, as though he was telling him, Son, you are paying the ultimate price to buy your own church, which is yours, and yours alone. That's why I turned my face away from you. And of course, in Acts, it tells us this is the church of God that he bought with his own blood. And then he's telling us here that this church that he owned with his blood, he said, from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our Father and he is our Lord. Now, there's another verse that would make it clearer. If you would open to us in the same epistle, chapter 11, verse 31, the God and Father of our Lord. Now, again, we'll see that again and again. There is a big difference. When he's speaking about God the Father, he always referred to him as the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 2 and 3, it says, Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. We see that. He's always mentioning the Lord Jesus Christ as God. We're going to go to Philippians chapter 4, verse 20. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 20. Now unto God and our Father. Here you cannot get it any clearer that our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, is God. Be glory forever and ever. Amen. And of course, every salutation was always referring to the Lord Jesus Christ as our God and as our Father. If you go to Colossians, the same thing, the same page there, verse 1 and 2, chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are in Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. God the Father, my Father, is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want to ask you a question. Can you give me a verse from the Scripture that shows very clearly, whether from the Old Testament or the New Testament, that Jesus is our Father? Can you remember a verse? Yes. John, what does it say? I and the Father are one. That's very good. That's one. Okay, that's excellent. But, uh, uh, yeah, but... Is there another verse you can remember? I know you remember, know that verse by heart. In the Old Testament, that shows us that Jesus is God, is, is the Father. All of us know it, okay? It's in Isaiah, chapter, chapter 9. Who would like to read that? And to us a child is born, and to us a child is given, and his name shall be called what? M wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, what? The everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Father of who? Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Now here it says very, very clearly that this great Savior that's coming, the Son of God, is an everlasting Father. Father of who? 
father of the church that he buys with his own blood. And he is, of course, he's God. He's not just another person or a prophet or a teacher. He is God who became flesh, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, because he was and is God. And then he claims that he is a father, not just a father, everlasting father. He is an everlasting father because he is an everlasting God. Now, of course, let's look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 12. Uh, let's see what that says. What that says. Giving thanks unto the Father, that's the Lord Jesus, which has made us meet the partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Who is this Father? He's the one that made us Christians. And the only one that made it possible for us to become Christians is the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Bible is very clear that Jesus Christ is God, who is our Father. And if you go to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 2, he said, To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Again and again, he pounds this very important idea that Jesus Christ is our God and he is our Lord. When he is our God and he's our Lord, he is our Father. Because the Bible is telling us that our Father and our God and our Lord is the same person, the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course we know our Father is the Lord Jesus Christ because he's the one that paid the price to allow us to be born into the family of God. He died for our sins. He carried our iniquity. And then what the Bible says, no man comes to the Father but by me. And therefore if I'm going to go to heaven, the only way to heaven is the Lord Jesus Christ, even though people were trying to convince us that there are many, many, many ways to heaven. Well, I'm sorry to tell them, when you die, you'll find out that your way is wrong if it's not the Lord Jesus Christ. Because there is one way and only one way to heaven. And the Bible is very clear on this issue when it says, Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved except and only solely the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you go under any other name, you'll never make it to heaven. That's why when I pray, our Heavenly Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. I'm only praying to the everlasting Father, the mighty God who died for me on the cross of Calvary. And in order to prove to you that when you pray our Father which art in heaven, you are praying to the Lord Jesus Christ, is what he said in John chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. He said, And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that I will do. Who's answering your prayers? The Almighty God, the everlasting Father, your Father, that begat you into the kingdom of God. Verse 14 of the same chapter says, And if ye shall ask, anything in my name i will do it see when you pray you pray to jesus in the name of jesus in order to have your prayers answered there is no other way and the bible is very clear about that so that's why he is our father and we pray to our father that begat us where is god the father in there you will find out in the next message but it's so important to know that at this time, before we go into the presence of God the Father, there is no Father that we can call Father except the Lord Jesus Christ. And to emphasize His relationship with us, His care for us, us being His children that He really, really cares for, He said in Mark chapter 9, verse 41, For whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name, because you belong to me, we are his children. Verily I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward. Wow! You cannot ignore this very, very important word that he just said. And the depth of that word. That because you belong to me. Why we belong to him? Because he's the only one that made himself of no reputation. Became in fashion as a man. Obeyed unto death. Even the death of the cross. Shed every drop of his blood in order to wash away every sin we commit and we belong to him we are his children 
And what a golden privilege. An eternity will not be long enough to thank him for what he's done for us. Look what's happening here. Two things. That we belong to him because we are his children. And that he will take care of the guys that will help us. That is fantastic. What a tremendous position we have at this time. And of course the Jehovah's Witnesses say that Jehovah is God the Father. But my Jesus said nobody has ever seen God the Father or heard his voice. However, therefore Jehovah cannot be God the Father. Everybody saw Jehovah. And talked with him. But Jesus said nobody seen the Father or heard his voice. How could that be? Unless Jehovah of the Old Testament is none but Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And if you look at Jehovah of the Old Testament, he's the one that says, I am a savior and there is none beside me. In the New Testament, it says, Jesus Christ, there is no name under heaven given among men by which we can be saved. He's the only savior. How can two people with tremendous power say, I'm the only savior, if there are two people? Unless there are one, in the Old Testament, he appeared as the Jehovah of the Old Testament. In the New Testament, he was Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You can recognize and compare all the attributes and we studied that at one time here where I'm not gonna go through it but you study the attributes of Jehovah of the Old Testament and the attributes of Jesus of the New Testament and you find that they are exactly the same he said in the Old Testament Jehovah said I'm the first and the last I'm the beginning and the ending in the New Testament revelation Jesus Christ I'm the first and the last I'm the beginning and the ending you cannot have two personalities saying the same thing one of them has to be lying or both of them are the same person in the old testament he revealed himself as jehovah in the new testament he revealed himself as jesus christ of nazareth therefore the jehovah of the old testament is none other but the second person of the trinity and unfortunately jehovah's witnesses don't even know that and they don't have the slightest idea who jehovah is and they call themselves jehovah's witnesses they're not jehovah's witnesses definitely because they don't know jehovah now here we see that Jesus was Jehovah. And if you notice, Jehovah of the Old Testament always referred to himself as the father of Israel. Let me read that to you. If you would go to Isaiah chapter 63. Isaiah 63 and verse 16. Doubtless thou art our father through Abraham. Be ignorant of us and Israel acknowledge us not. Thou, O Lord, art our father, our redeemer. Thy name is from everlasting. The only Redeemer is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's that is Isaiah talking to someone he can approach and he has communication with. And that was Jehovah. And he's our Father. He's the everlasting Father. And then the Lord Jesus Christ, if you notice, know when he talked to his disciples so many times, what did he call them? My children. When he talked to the paralyzed man that he came to uh, heal, he said, Son, get up even though he was 33 years old but he was the god that appeared on this earth now he, he was our father definitely in the old testament he called israel my children in the new testament he called his disciples my children now he is our father as a matter of fact let's open to romans chapter 15 romans chapter 15 and verse 6 we're going to study another batch of verses that makes it so clear chapter 15 and verse 6 it says that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify god even the father of our lord jesus christ this shows that every time they referred to god the father they call him the father of our lord jesus christ he's the father of our lord jesus christ when they refer to our father they refer to the Savior who died for us and bought us with his own blood. That is very important for me to understand. That's when I pray, our Father which art in heaven, I'm praying to Jesus. He is my Father. He died for my sins. And he is dealing with me. God the Father never dealt with anybody. As a matter of fact, if you read John chapter 5, it tells you that very clearly, that God nobody ever heard his voice in the old testament but in the old testament everybody heard the voice of god but that was the second person of the trinity and of course this study that we are uh, embarking upon shows us the importance of the knowledge of the trinity and that the trinity is in existence there is god the father god the son and god the holy ghost god the father and god the holy ghost are involved in our uh, redemption but the executor of our redemption was the second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And that's why he is our father. When I pray, I am praying to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he said, whenever you pray in my name, of course, we're talking in the name of Jesus, the Jesus that appeared in the flesh. But his spirit fills the whole heavens and the whole earth. And he is God. And we are praying to him. And God the Father gave all the declarations that was made to the world, to Jesus. And if you look at all the declarations that were made, for which the Bible called the Lord Jesus Christ the messenger of the covenant. He was appearing to Noah. He was appearing to Abraham. He was appearing to all the prophets and to the kings of Israel, telling them about the coming of the Messiah. And that Messiah, which was him, of course, that was going to establish the new covenant that was so important, without which no one can go to heaven. So that's why he was called the messenger or the angel of the covenant. Now here we see something extremely important, that we are the children of God. And this children of God is not by acquiring it haphazardly, no, but by being born into the family of God. We are born into the family of God. And Jesus is our father. And he's the one that is dealing with us. He's the one that appeared to all the prophets to announce and to predict his coming. And he was the one that came and he was the one that died. And now, frankly, every time I hear this testimony, and especially it is happening a lot among Muslims and Jewish people, that they got saved because they saw in a dream or in a vision the Lord Jesus Christ. I've never heard anybody saying, oh, I saw God the Father or I saw the Holy Spirit, even though the Holy Spirit is working in their heart, but they don't see that. Why? The Holy Spirit has to give all the glory to Jesus, who did all the work for our redemption. When you become saved, the Holy Spirit helps you to focus all your attention and your eyes on the one that died for you on the cross of Calvary. And that's, you know, is the real test whether a person is doing something wrong or he's fake by listening to him. If he tried to divert any of the attention from the Lord Jesus Christ to put it on anybody else is a fake. Because the Holy Spirit's attention is totally on the Lord Jesus Christ because the Lord Jesus Christ was the one that died for us on the cross. Now we established two things, that Jesus is Father, and the Bible tells us that in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And we are his children by birth. The question is, why it's a must that we are adopted? <laughs> I'm sorry, because it, it was going to take about another half an hour. But uh, it will be a good lesson for us. But at least now we have the basis that we are born into the family of God. We really don't need to be adopted, but we have to be adopted. Why? Maybe you can think about it and come up with some answer. I'll ask next time we come back to see what you come up with. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank thee for Jesus Christ. We thank thee for thy goodness, thy grace. We thank thee because you're a wonderful God who loved us so much that sent your only begotten Son to die on the cross of Calvary for our sins to give us the privilege to be born into the family of God and be part of that family. And we thank you also for the idea of adoption and uh, thank you because you allow us to understand your purpose and your intention because you want us to be informed. Bless us.